And our next presenter is William Alia. He is the manager of PCD IT security solutions within Shell. He is a mechanical engineer with 20 years experience working cybersecurity across a number of industries. And he will present a case study, Shell's focus on core security controls. Please welcome William. Thanks, Dale, for the opportunity to be here and present this. Uh, Dale says he, he chased us pretty hard, but you know, to be quite honest, it, I like to talk about this. He, he followed up with us a little bit, and, uh, and I jumped at the opportunity. Um, for those who may not be aware, Shell over the past uh, few years has taken a very critical look at how we address information security in, in their process control environment. We've considered um, some of the standards and some of the, the technologies that we used to mandate. Uh, and we took a very critical look to ensure that we were approaching IT security and process control the right way. We found in some cases that yes, we were, and in others we needed to, to revise our approach. Uh, for those out here who have a short attention span, basically, we came to the conclusion that we need a very clear vision and mission statement. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And we needed to get back to the basics. Make sure that we have a strong foundation in place upon which we can build and implement the new latest, greatest uh, technologies, solutions, processes to help us get to where we need to be. Now, for people with a longer attention span, I've got a whole slide deck here I'll walk through and we can uh, talk about some of the things we learned. Uh, over the past three years of, of executing this overall uh, program and over the past year and a half of deploying into all of our uh, assets, upstream, downstream, varying uh, requirements, varying degrees of uh, well, varying appetites for consumption. So I, I want to start out, of course, with a summary of the entire presentation. If you can read that. Uh, quite simply, this is uh, standard legal information letting you know that yes, we are being very open here. We're letting you know what we've seen that works and doesn't work. Um, so please be aware that uh, uh, that openness does come with its certain responsibilities. Okay? Um, I want to start out talking about FUD. I'm very pleased to hear, and yesterday and in the, the introductions this morning, we're not all talking about FUD. It has its place. It raises awareness. People understand that there is a threat out there. It doesn't just go away because you put a firewall in. But at the same time, it's not a valid way to sell your business case, especially in an engineering environment you will be met with, yes, that sounds scary, but it hasn't happened to us. We're talking about engineers. We're talking about very practical people. They don't stay awake at night because they've watched a zombie apocalypse movie, right? They understand that that zombie apocalypse is not going to come out of the screen. It's not going to destroy their process control environment, their industrial automation control systems. The threat is there. We need to be aware and keep that awareness there without screaming the sky is falling. The presentation yesterday about uh, Iron Gate, great. I, I, I thought it was a, the perfect message. Is there a risk? Yes, there is. Is it the next thermonuclear explosion initiated by a nation state? We don't know. Let's not say that it is, and let's not start screaming the world is coming to an end. Okay. You may think, well, it's Shell. You have lots of money, you have lots of people, you can do whatever you want. Where's the challenge for Shell? Quite obviously, there are a number of challenges. Just that size in itself brings the challenges. When we talk about where we're operating, we talk about the differences between upstream, downstream, trading, um, how it's different operating in Gabon versus the Netherlands. <clears throat> There's some very different challenges and the, the controls and the standards that we put in place must be able to cope with all of those. We must be able to, to move forward in all those different areas. Um, again, there are differences between upstream, between downstream, between trading that we have to be able to make sure we can hit a minimum security level. 
across those organizations, and we can measure that in a standardized way without putting too much burden on any one of those lines of business. Um, obviously, uh, as we go through the different organizations, the level of governance, the style of governance uh, differs greatly, and the suppliers that we have involved are different. And some of the suppliers that are representing here today, well, all the suppliers that are representing here today and yesterday, we work with uh, in a very proactive and effective way. We don't call up and say, hey guys, uh, maybe we're going to have a problem sometime in the future. We work with them now to make sure that we don't have that problem in the future. Uh, they've been amazingly cooperative in making sure that we can progress in that way. Um, we do realize there's a difference between engineering and IT. Uh, during the panel discussion yesterday, you know, the message was, hey, if IT companies want to adapt with us, wonderful, let's work together. Right? And that's the same, same message that, that we will bring forward. An IT company says, we know better than you. We know how this works. You don't. Well, maybe we'll give you that half hour presentation, but we're not going to call you back. Right? Listen to us. We know our business. Your tools, your solutions are there to help us with our business. They are not there because they're cool tools. And, and of course, we have devices around the world in some of the most challenging places to get to. Um, simply showing up, uh, change out a card, and, and going home may involve jumping on a helicopter in uh, difficult weather out into the middle of the North Sea uh, for someone who could be an engineer, who could be there to improve the process, who could be there to, to increase production. If that IT person needs to go to do that, there's a definite impact on the business. Okay, so start with a very clear mission and a very clear vision. For us, we don't want to cause any health, safety, or environmental damage. We don't want to interrupt our production, and we don't want to lead to product deferment or loss. And the text here at the bottom of the screen is probably too small for most everyone to read, but it lays out our basic approach to how we address IT security and process control. We buy secure solutions. We deploy them in a secure manner, and we run them in a secure manner. It's pretty basic, right? We think securely. We continue to emphasize, not through FUD, but through valid business conversations, why this is important. We work with the vendors. Again, every one of the uh, automation vendors that was on the panel here yesterday, <clears throat> we're actively working with to make sure that the solutions we buy from them are secure when they come out of the box. They integrate with some of the other technologies and solutions that we have in place so we can take immediate advantage of those. We also have to look and consider, you know, we're not buying security solutions to protect against the zombie apocalypse. We are buying security solutions to make sure that we can enhance the way that we do business. We are looking at unmanned, demand operations. We're looking at operating in some of the most difficult uh, regions in the world. Geopolitical reasons, simply uh, the, the challenges of getting the right resources there. What we need to emphasize is that we are approaching PCD IT security from the angle of opportunity. Now, when we start talking about our standards and how we define and build them, we are talking to engineers. The bow tie model, the top left. I, I've heard some side conversations about the bow tie model, maybe referred to as something else, but the basic structure uh, with, a, with a top event, what's really going to happen? What is that security threat? On the left hand side, we've got some, some controls to stop to make sure that threat doesn't come to fruition. On the right hand side, we've got other controls to make sure that if it does happen, how do we limit that impact? That, that bow tie model is something that's very familiar to our engineering environment, to, to our engineers. How do we define IT security standards in a way that they will understand it? These are the people that have to work with on a daily basis. They must understand it. A simple graphical representation here on the bottom right helps to do that. 
Now let's, let's look at what's in here. A lot of the things that we heard about yesterday, maybe it was a passing comment, maybe it was uh, we investigated a little bit, but let's talk about workforce development, making sure that we have the right people in place, change management, making sure that as we progress in this journey that we're all taking together, we do it in a way that is sustainable. We know what's there. The asset inventory, log collection, network segmentation, network architecture is referred to here. Incident response. These are all the basic things that everybody here, I think, has discussed yesterday. It's simple, in theory, and it's the foundation that must be there before we can start using the latest, greatest, shiny objects that guarantee through simple installation of that product, it will save us from certain destruction. <clears throat> An IDS system, for example, that has 100% detection rate, 0% false positives, is a wonderful thing in fairyland. Could be a wonderful thing. But if you don't have a governance structure in place that allows you to, uh, to use that, if you don't have the right resources in place to know how to deal with that, and if you don't have an incident response policy in place to guide how that investigation, how that recovery happens, you've wasted your money on that wonderful product. You can sit back in your security operations center, which you've probably spent tens of millions of dollars on, and say, hey, Site X is about to explode and sit back and wait and watch it happen. I can't have that. Get the basics in place. Make sure that before you implement that latest, greatest, newest technology or solution, you can sustain it. You will get some value out of it. Now, how do you determine what that foundation is? This is something I can almost guarantee you can't read from there, but the message is on the left-hand side, understand what your risks are. In the, the vertical axis here, we have defined within Shell our threat vectors, our threat scenarios. We have taken the opportunity to consolidate what we believe to be valid threat scenarios into this number. There are 13 of them, I think. That's it. No more. I will challenge you after the presentation, come up to me and present me with a scenario that you believe to be a valid threat scenario, which I cannot classify into one of these. These range from natural occurrences, an example I used with some people yesterday, elephants stepping on fiber. Yes, that is a valid threat. That is something that we do have to consider. All the way through nation state attacks. Anything you can think of in between, I will almost guarantee you I can fit into one of those. We've gone out, we've talked to people, uh, we've used our connections uh, through the past, and we have made that same challenge. We have not increased that number of threat scenarios. Right? So on the left, we evaluate where we are, where we were, based upon those threat scenarios. We introduce those 13 different practice areas, that foundation, and it brings us to the right-hand side, obviously. Red is bad, blue is good. Yeah. We, we move along away from a, a, a potentially dangerous situation that Shell has deemed as unacceptable, and we move into a region where it is acceptable. We understand what the risks are, and we are not building uh, multi-billion dollar infrastructures to protect against a nation state invasion on one of our refineries, right? That's not as low as reasonably practicable. You may have heard if you've ever done any work with Shell. But there are reasonable measures to put in place to bring that risk to an acceptable business level. Once we've done that, we've created one standard with two interpretations. Um, that goes into our uh, engineering documentation used for capital projects. That's how we build new greenfield locations or how we introduce new capital projects and new capabilities uh, into our existing locations. We also have the, risk, the PCD risk profile, which is the same content, but transformed into a um, run and maintain standard. If you build according to the depth, you will find that you comply with the PCD risk profile. 
There's one standard to rule them all within process control IT security. Okay? A big part of this, obviously, and we've talked about making sure that awareness is there, our workforce is developed into uh, an effective workforce that can deal with the standards, the technologies, the processes that we have in place. Um, this is where, again, Shell may have the advantage. When we create some of these materials, the, these awareness materials that get out into the field, we can spend a little bit of money on that, right? It helps to raise that awareness. It is the positive form of FUD. We're not trying to scare you. We're just trying to make sure that you are aware of what those risks are and the basic steps that you need to take care of to uh, remediate those risks. We've also developed a quite comprehensive standard for our workforce to make sure that every role that's involved in process control IT security, to make sure we and they understand what's going to be expected of them. What level of skill do we expect them to have in different areas? We know these people are in our engineering environment. They were generally hired because they're good engineers. We need to make sure that they are also good PCD IT security practitioners. These standards within the workforce development help to move them in that direction help to make sure that we have that hybrid skill set between engineering and IT security. That's what we need. In order to do that, we work together with a number of different uh, people in the industry to come up with the GICSPA certification. Now, that's not the be-all, end-all certification that guarantees that everyone you're working with uh, has superpowers and is capable of dealing with any security uh, situation in process control. But it is a certain level of assurance that they do understand the engineering world and they do understand some of the threats and the, the ways to work in process control IT security. So once we've had that in place, we have the opportunity to look at how we can facilitate some of the activities we need to undertake. We could do that by building tools that support those standards. Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to try and build a tool that does everything. If it ties my shoes for me in the morning and makes me a cup of coffee while it does that, I have over-engineered it. I've built something that is not useful. We've worked with a number of uh, partners in our areas. Some of them are here, some of them are sponsors. To come together and build what we call Secure Plant, which has gone out into the market as Secure Ops. It provides us with coverage in these technical areas within our risk profile. It is a tool that is built to support the risk profile. It is a living tool. As it is deployed out in the field, we listen to our engineers, we listen to the users, we listen to the vendors who use this tool to gain remote access into our process control domain. The requirements come back in, we evaluate, determine if it makes sense, does it fall within the security realm? And should that be moved forward to our partners to make sure it gets incorporated into future versions? And that's a wonderful thing, to have a tool to help facilitate enforcement of our standards. Now, for the engineers out in the audience, it doesn't exist unless you can see it, unless you can measure it. That's where Plant Check comes in. That, that's our sister component to, to Secure Plant. Plant Check actually takes some of the information out of Secure Plant and uses that to measure the uh, organizational maturity and compliance associated with the standards. It goes beyond that, and it implements uh, a way to measure the operational effectiveness of some of the non-technical components as well. Our governance, our workforce development, our management of change. It's great to have a document that says this is how we're going to do it, and for that document to be a good document, but if you stick it in a, in a drawer, you never look at it, and you don't follow it, it's useless. So we also need a way to make sure that, it is being, that our operations are being handled in that way so that they can be effective. That's what the plant check tool helps us to do. Now, what did we learn? Quite a lot, right? This is, this is the, the longer version of my summary in the beginning. We have to have a clear vision mission, and strategy. 
Without it, you can stand up in front of people, you can talk about whatever you want, but you have no way to ensure you are delivering what you need to deliver. Simplify, standardize, focus on getting the basics right. That is your foundation upon which you or your clients can build upon. Again, if you don't have these things in place, it doesn't matter what technology you buy. It won't work. Concentrate on the basics and then start looking at the latest, greatest technologies for implementation. Apply those basics throughout the entire life cycle. Again, buy, deploy, run, secure. Is there any particular reason that that can't happen? Should those different stages be addressed in very different ways? No. Work with your vendors up front so that when you buy it, you know it does what you want it to do the way that you want to do it. Deploy it in a safe manner. Don't cave to the pressure of, it just needs to get done today. Make it happen and then we'll wor worry about security later. Right? And of course, run it in a secure manner. This comes back to all the management of change, uh, the, the workforce development, etc. If you do it this way, when people challenge you and say, why does it cost this much? Why does it take that long? You will be able to fall back on facts. You will be able to fall back on information that you have previously reviewed, agreed with that line of business, with that client, that that is the way to go. You don't have to rely on the, the next Stuxnet coming out in order to get that money. Um, when you move forward with your standards and how you're going to implement them, bear in mind that yes, you can direct how a risk should be mitigated or the outcome of that, but it doesn't necessarily give you the ability to dictate what technology or what process is used to do that. If your line of business implements, if one line of business implements technology X, second line of business will implement a process Y, if they both reduce risk to the level that you have deemed acceptable, or your overall organization is deemed acceptable, fine. Um, shiny objects. This is a, a phrase, uh, those who know Tyler Williams, uh, I'm sure you've heard him say it a million times. Shiny objects are pretty. They sound great. They purport to save you from the impending apocalypse. Without the standards in place, they are simply that. They are shiny objects. You walk past them in a security operations center and you see lots of flashing lights. Something good must be happening, or bad, but it's doing its job. Avoid shiny objects until you have the foundations in place. Don't be distracted along the way. Uh, as I mentioned before, this, this hybrid uh, skill set between engineering and IT is critical to make sure that uh, in the industrial automation area, we get to where we need to be. Throw a bunch of IT people with no industrial experience in a process control domain, and you may get statements like, oh, it's not working, reboot it. Right? I, I, we all know better than that. But that's a message that has to get through the organization. You need that hybrid skill set who understands what their production environment is like in order to be effective in uh, IT security. Again, I, I commented on the, the supplier panel from yesterday. I think it's wonderful that the representation is here um, and that they understand the importance of and the environment that we're working in. Get suppliers involved early. I, I heard a comment, and, and Dale and I talked about it yesterday a little bit. Hey, security should, it should be free. Right? Now, of course, there are qualifiers associated with that statement, but we do need to expect the basics from security management from our suppliers. We, we are actively working and pushing to make sure that, that we can get that, but also understanding that if you're asking for more, that's more than that, if you're asking for some, something above and beyond and extravagant, you're going to pay for it. Don't sit back and expect to get things for free uh, when perhaps you should be paying for it. Stay close to deployment. Doesn't mean that you have to run deployment, especially in Shell, we have different organizations, different programs that handle deployment of our technologies, our solutions, our processes once they are defined. But I will caution you, stay close to that deployment. Make sure that you are there when they reach out for help. Um, otherwise, uh, 
they may find a way to do things that you don't necessarily agree with. Support them. Be there for them. And finally, take that opportunity to loop back. Look at what you've done and be very critical. Your vision may have been wonderful. Your direction, your solutions may have been perfect in your mind at the time. Take the opportunity to look back and make sure that you are gaining something from that. Make sure that you are delivering value to the business and it's not just another technical exercise of deployment. Okay, thank you. And I think at this point, uh, we'll take some questions. Thank you, William. Do we have some questions for William? Well, you let me off easy on a Friday morning. Well, I'll, I'll start out with one. Uh, so some of the security control areas you were talking about, you know, definitely weren't shiny objects. They weren't necessarily technical objects, um, like management of change or security, I guess, workforce development and that. How are you developing metrics for those and automatically collecting that data across this global enterprise that Shell is running? Right. Well, the, the metrics are developed quite simply um, in a way that we can measure, as I've said before, uh, that a standard is in place to make sure the operations run in a certain way. Now, as we move forward in the operation of those, uh, there are different uh, questions that we ask, different forms of evidence that we require in order to determine if these uh, controls are being handled properly. Now, in certain areas, the automated you know, collection is in place. If we look at um, things like asset inventory, if we look at things like log collection, etc., that's easy. That's what we use Secure Plant to do. Uh, that's our technology. But when we look at some of the other solutions, the, the governance, the workforce development, the management of change, it's not so easy to, to automatically collect those. Uh, we do have an assurance process that we used to go through with different sites, with different lines of business to make sure that those are manually being executed. The reporting of that is something that is uh, rolled up and automatically generated through the plant check solution. And then, so Shell is a global operation, you know, upstream, downstream, a lot of different areas. Are you then providing management with a dashboard? Are you able to say Absolutely. we're doing well in this region but not that region or this sector but not that sector? Absolutely. Again, through the plant check solution, it does offer dashboards at various levels. For example, uh, a dashboard available for a site focal point or someone who's responsible for a single location. We have dashboards that are available for uh, different levels throughout the line of business. So if you're in downstream manufacturing, that can all be rolled up into a, a single view. Um, we have dashboards based upon region. So if you're, uh, your responsibilities lie in North America or Europe, you can see only that region. If you need to see it all, you can see it all. Uh, let's explore one other area. So you, I, I heard Tyler talk about this a little over a year ago, and I know Shell had been working on it for a while before that. What is one of the areas that the metrics or your experience with this program resulted in a significant change in approach? You know, was there one of the 13 core security controls that you said, we need to do this a different way or, or some major lesson learned now that you've been doing this for a couple of years? Well, you, actually, and to be quite honest, most of them, right? We're a bunch of smart people sitting in the center who think we know everything. The sooner you get into the real world, you discover you don't. Uh, the feedback that we have from uh, our lines of business, from uh, technical uh, contacts per location, uh, has been invaluable in updating what that standard is, how the standard is used, um, evidence that is required in order to, uh, to prove that we are being effective in the different areas. So it's, it's an everyday journey to develop and evolve in a structured manner what those standards are, how we measure them, and how that uh, is represented back to management. Okay, last call for questions? Okay, thank you very much, William. Right, thank you.